Good afternoon, everyone. It is my honor and privilege to welcome Ms. Susan Harris um, here today. Uh, Susan Harris the, is the editorial director of Words Without Borders and the co-editor with Ilya Kaminsky um, of the Echo Anthology of International Poetry. She is the former director and editor-in-chief editor of Northwestern University Press, where she founded the Hydra imprint of literature in translation and published Emire, Emir Kirtaj, sorry, and Herta Müller before their Nobel Prizes. Um, please give a round of applause to our guest speaker. Thank you, Bob and Nina, and thanks to all of you. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I understand that many of you are using our anthology uh, literature from the axis of evil. And I'm going to talk about that and also talk about Words Without Borders, um, our magazine. Um, wordswithoutborders.org, um, available online, free, um, was, founded, it was founded in the early two thousand in 2000 and launched in 2003. We publish literature and translation from all languages. And much of our mission has to do with the fact that we as Americans know horrifyingly little about the rest of the world. And I think one of the best indications of that is that whereas probably 50% of the literature that's published in Europe is translated from English. Only 3% of the literature that is published in the US is in translation. And if you think about the number of books published, that means that somewhere maybe around 400 books a year are being published in translation from other languages. Right away, that, that shows you we have what you could refer to as a trade imbalance. We export and we don't import. And without importing, without understanding the literature of the rest of the world, we, are, we, we develop an insular society, we develop a very ignorant society and also an arrogant society in which we think that our way is the one way. Um, it is crucial, we feel, to understand the rest of the world and particularly as Americans, we, under, we know so much of the world through a strictly political prism. And we know countries simply as their status of enemy nations. Uh, so much of our mission was predicated um, on the reaction, on the aftermath of the events of September 11th, when we realized that we were, we were being attacked by countries by a force that we did not understand and also a force that did not consider us as individuals either. That obviously the attacks of September 11th were directed toward some monolithic idea of a country, not toward the individuals who were actually affected. So we do believe that one of the best entrees one of the best ways to explore other countries and to understand them is through their culture, which we feel is absolutely best represented by their literature. Um, when we think about the countries that are the so-called axis of evil countries, if we know Iraq and Iran simply as political beings, then we are missing out on the rich varied and beautiful history, for example, of Persian literature. We have no understanding of, say, the relationship between Iran and Iraq, the wars that they've been immersed in for so long, and how that has affected them. We have no idea if we, if we know only that North Korea is a dictatorship. But we can't really understand that until we see the literature. So. When Words Without Borders was founded, our first three issues were fe featured literature from Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. And what we found so fascinating 
in particular about North Korea was that we had assumed that like Russia, like Eastern Europe, like so many other oppressed countries, that there was an underground literature, that there was a subversive movement, and that that literature was being smuggled out um, or was being, um, was being dis uh, circulated privately and underground, much like Samizdat in the former Soviet Union. What we discovered was actually far more terrifying, which is that in North Korea, there is one literary magazine that is operated by the state and the only writers in North Korea who publish, publish in that magazine. And what passes for fiction or what they consider fiction, what they consider topics, we would, we would identify as pure propaganda. And those of you who read, for example, um, the, the wonderful story about the, uh, the man who gave up his, his, career, his uh, career in music to serve the great leader, understand that that is not intended primarily as a story of one person's struggle. That is intended as a message, as a guideline to all North Koreans to subsume themselves, their own goals, their own desires in those of the state and to worship the great leader and to let the great leader dictate all that everyone does. So our first issues were Iran, Iraq, North Korea. And as we were publishing the magazine, uh, we also began working on the anthology. Um, again, after September 11th, uh, President Bush referred to the axis of evil. Again, looking at countries strictly through, through that strictly political prism and also making each country into one body, one thing, completely absent of nuance, of any kind of degree, of any kind of variation. So we took those seven enemy nations, um, again, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, um, and then also Libya, Sudan, Syria, Cuba. And we took literature from those countries. And again, we were startled at and very pleased at the range because these are countries that we think, you know, in many, many of us, you know, many of the reaction is, oh, these, these, these countries have cities, you know, they, they, they don't all live in huts, you know, they don't, they don't all, you know, ride donkeys. And I think what we found was not only the absolute beauty of, say, a poem like Baghdad, My, My Beloved, so sorrowful and so mournful, but also the wonderful humor of the story, The Vice, the vice Principal. Um, the stories in the, in the volume that demonstrate both the sorrow of the writers having to work within the oppression and also the writers, many of the, the many writers in the volume who actually had to flee or were expelled from their countries and now live in exile. At the time that the volume was published, fully half the authors contributed half the, the contributors are living in exile. And I think it is some indication of political situations when writers are not free to express their positions without, be, without being threatened with imprisonment or other sorts of censorship. So the Axis of Evil anthology is at, was the first of our five print anthologies, each of which is intended to help readers understand more of the world and I will show you the pages about each of them. The Axis of Evil was our first anthology. After that, we published The World Through the Eyes of Writers. It is a less overtly political collection in which 25 older, well-established international writers recommended the work of 25 younger or emerging writers. And again, we have the, uh, the work appears with the introductions and then the, trans the work in translation. Uh, many of the writers in this volume, since its publication, have gone on to be published in English, another huge part of our mission. Um, then our third anthology, The Wall in My Head, was produced 
to coincide with the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall in October 2009. And that collected half work that was written at the time or around the time, and also new work by writers looking back. Um, again, we cannot understand contemporary Germany without understanding their pre without understanding reunification, without understanding the difference between East Germany and West Germany, and without understanding how that has affected the writers and the culture. It is a crucial, it is a crucial path to comprehending that society. Then our fourth anthology, the Echo Anthology of International Poetry. Um, this was ed edited by our poetry editor, Ilya Kaminsky, himself an absolutely gorgeous poet, definitely someone whose work you should um, look into. Um, and we put this collection together with the, with the intention of providing as broad a scope as possible of what we think of as international contemporary poetry. Um, we start with Tagore and we end with Valtzina Mort, who is a um, excellent young rising Belarusian poet. And again, we tried very much to represent the entire, the entire world and to represent all poetic traditions. Um, any anthology is, of course, a, any anthology is a failure on some level. Um, we like to think that this is more of a success, but um, each anthology represents an F, each anthology of previously published work, of course, represents the editor's attempt to communicate and to organize the genre and to pre present the finest examples of those genres to readers. And then our most recent anthology, whoops. Our most recent anthology, Tablet and Pen, is Literary Landscapes of the Modern Middle East. And we produced, we collected writing from, uh, from Turkey, uh, from Pakistan, writing in Urdu, writing in Turkish, writing in Arabic, um, to, dem to give a timeline of the development of Middle Eastern literature and to place it in that, in a context of what was happening in the literature as it was called, as the countries were colonized. Again, this has been our most successful uh, uh, anthology. The guest editor, Reza Aslan, is a very accomplished scholar. And this, again, um, is more, more of our mission in familiarizing um, the English language audience, and especially the American audience, with marvelous examples of the literature of these countries to indicate the tradition again and to provide a context in which contemporary literature can be read. So I thought we would look around the magazine a bit and talk about what we do. Again, as I said, we, were, uh, we launched in 2003. We publish monthly. Each issue has a theme, either a topic or a linguistic theme or a country theme. So for example, every February, we publish a graphic novel issue. It's always one of my favorites. Um, I mentioned our first three issues. We also had an issue uh, of literature from the Scandinavian countries in which we featured Norwegian, Finnish, Swedish, and Danish literature. And we also have topic issues like the one that we've done this month, which is somewhat out of character for us. Um, Again, we, we want to work with literature because it is not expressly political, because literature, literature evokes and reflects culture as opposed to um, political theory or political philosophy. Um, and normally what we are doing is looking for literature that helps illuminate current events, that helps us, again, un understand what is going on in the rest of the world. But we do address, we are conscious of political events, of social events. And we decided for this march that we would publish an issue of writing on the Mexican drug wars. Because as, we, as you know, if you have read actual rep uh, reportage 
or eyewitness reports, there is, a, there is a level of understanding, of representation, of reporting that is simply not possible from anything but the eyewitness perspective and from the native perspective. And a number of American journalists have written about the situation in Mexico, but very little has been published in the U.S. from the perspective of Mexican writers themselves. Uh, the, the impetus for the project came when our guest editor, uh, Carmen Buyosa, uh, who has lived in Brooklyn for many years, but like so many of the, so many of the Mexican writers, is absolutely heartbroken at what has happened to her country, to the lawlessness, to the violence, to the senselessness of the body count, um, all in the service of drug culture. Um, it is something that the U.S. is aware of, but is not does not necessarily grasp the effect of and the impact on the people who live with this, um, the people who live in Ciudad Juarez, or who have to deal with the fact that they are, take, they, they are living among violence, that it, having a child leave the house simply to walk down the street is fraught with danger. Uh, so our guest editor solicited writing uh, primarily essays, but also interviews and reporting, and a couple of fiction pieces to give a fuller sense of what this has done to Mexico in the hopes that Americans will read and understand and consider what our recreational, I hate to say our recreational drug culture, but um, to consider what recreational drug culture in the U.S. has visited upon the people who have to live among the, who have to live among the source. And again, that, is a, that was a rare issue for us in that we don't normally take on political or current events so directly. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do as an online publication is respond very quickly to, public, to current events, to news, to developments. Um, as an example, several years ago when Fidel Castro uh, turned over the reins of his government to his brother Raul, I was aware of a no wonderful novel called The Autobiography of Fidel Castro. Obviously, it's a, it's a fiction. Um, written by a former um, aide of his who now, needless to say, lives in Miami. And we were a I was able to commission a chapter, a translation of a chapter from that novel and publish it the week after this happened. Um, last year, in another example of how we can respond and provide some insight into, into uh, current events. Last year, I had planned an issue of Algerian literature for August. And I had planned to do Arabic, French, and Berber literature. And I was very much looking forward to publishing the Berber, which, as you can imagine, is very underrepresented, underrepresented in English. And then in January, um, the uprisings began, and it became very clear that I could, I could not simply publish an issue of literature and pretend that nothing was changing in the country itself. Well, then January moved into February, and the dominoes started, started falling. So what we did last year was unmake the entire editorial schedule for the second half of the year. And we ended up, for July and August, publishing two issues of writing from the Arab Spring. And let me show you those. In July, we published work from the African countries. Um, we had work from Tunisia, from Algeria, from Egypt, um, also from Sudan. And one piece that, again, the great benefit of publishing online and the fact that we do have translators who will uh, work like demons uh, under, under the right circumstances, uh, this, this piece, 
this piece an open letter to Mohammed Bouazizi. Mohammed Bouazizi is the young Tunisian who set himself on fire and really started the events of the Arab Spring going. Um, this piece by Boualem Sansal, who is a famous Algerian writer, was published in French in the Paris newspaper Le Monde on June 15th and appeared in English translation in our, in our pages July 1st. So to give an idea of the immediacy that is possible. Um, it's also, I'm sure I don't need to point out, it, um, exceedingly stressful for the editors. But, but we were able, again, to look at what was happening in the Arab Spring and to realize that to fully understand that, Americans and English language readers need to see not only what is happening, but what, what characterized the culture, what developed these cultures, what are these cultures like in that this has happened? What is the context in which this, uh, these uprisings have occurred? And so we were able to, to have a combination of, again, the essay by Boualem Sansal, but also fiction, poetry, fiction and poetry as well. Um, again, the, much of the poetry, much of the poetry being predicated on the notion of loss, of sorrow, of the grieving. I think of particularly in this, uh, this poem by um, Amina Saeed. From now on the mothers will sleep alone among the portraits of the dead. Uh, the mothers wander among the graves of the departed. And again, the, the complete, the, the notion again of the loss of life and the effect of wars and of uprisings and of oppressive governments on the individual and the notion that there is this connection across countries, across governments, um, again, so crucial. So we did the African nations in July and then in August, this was another, another wonderful part. We were able to do an interview with the only woman publisher in Tunisia, which you can imagine um, the sorts of things that she, that she was able to tell us. Um, and then in August, oops. and in August, uh, we went into the Middle East. Uh, our lead essay that, uh, that month was a conversation with Rafiq Shami, um, a Syrian writer banned by the government, expelled from Syria. He's lived in Germany for 40 years. He writes in German. And I think there is no better indication of exile and of alienation than to think that you have been forced out of not only your native country, but your native language, your mother language. And Shami has always been an excellent commenter both on Syrian culture and the context, but also from his vantage point in Germany, he, has been, he is able to comment very astutely and freely on the government. That was a very valuable interview. And again, that was something that was published in Germany in July. We were able to have it translated and published uh, for the first time in English in August. Um, and we also had, again, uh, pieces from Libya. Uh, this, in fact, where are we? Um, we had, we had one um, wonderful piece um, from Libya in the July issue um, about a theme park for deposed dictators. And the dictators, uh, um, and what one dictator was very, uh, was very clearly based on Gaddafi, um, who at that point was still alive. Uh, but of course, the, the dictators were all you know, arguing with each other, and Stalin was being very, um, very unpleasant at the dinner table and that kind of thing. But, um, and then all of them um, were supposed to appear, and they went out um, and got caught up with a group of um, young women and wanted to go dancing. <laughs> and it was very, very entertaining. Um, it's been bought for English publication, I'm glad to say. But again, I think what we were doing with those issues was perhaps more of a more overt representation of our mission, but bringing a part of the world to our readers, our readers who come to us for information on what is happening in the rest of the world, on context 
again, not necessarily, not only political government um, news events, but the context. What, you know, what does what does this mean? Why why is this happening in Egypt? Um, we have one of one wonderful success story. We have. Let me show you this. Um, as I mentioned, we have. Um, as I mentioned, we do a graphic novel issue every year. And in 2008, I, I became aware of, and in 2008, I learned of a graphic novel that was going to be published in Egypt, in Cairo, later that year. And it was called, it's called Metro, and it's about a young man very frustrated, a wonderful drawing, isn't it? Um, it's about a young man frustrated with, his, in, frustrated with his inability to find a job and completely fed up with the rampant corruption of Egypt, of the, of the Kyrene government. And this was obviously a very incendiary novel, but I bought the rights, commissioned the translation, we published it in our graphic novel issue in February. Well, his book came out in April, and the day of its publication, the police stormed the publisher's office, confiscated all of the copies, threw Magdi, the, the author, and his publisher in jail, went to the bookshops and told the bookstore owners, not only you must take this off your shelves, but you must wipe all records of this. You must wipe all evidence of this book from your records. The government wanted to completely obliterate not only the work, but the fact that it had existed. To give you an idea of what the gov how, how uh, obviously how guilty the, the government felt itself in this uh, being accused of this corruption. Magdi and his publisher were eventually released from jail. The trial was, um, was on and then continued for um, any number of times. Finally was resolved in Magdi's, um, finally was resolved in a way that both sides felt they could claim victory. Magdi and, her publish and his publisher were both fined. They were not thrown into prison. Um, and the government still has not permitted the publication of Metro in Egypt. Well, in the meantime, we wanted very much to help Magdi find a publisher. And Magdi came to the US in November of 2009, and we took him to meet with an agent who'd been interested, and spoke with him, and uh, the agent agreed to consider the project. And of course, then came the uprising and Arab Spring. So Magdi's book has been bought for English language publication. And again, it's an example of having a book about Egyptian corruption just at the time that Mubarak was being toppled. Um, Magdi also did another wonderful thing for us for last year's graphic novel issue. Um, I asked him to draw the events of Tahrir Square and to send them to us. And this is what he did. Magdi and his other uh, cartoonist friends were drawing and writing and circulating uh, daily, public, uh, daily broadsides about, about the, the protests. And you know, one of the problems with reporting on demonstrations and on uprisings is that you want to try to capture the slogans and the, and the posters, but of course they're so dependent on rhythm and rhyme. But our translator, Humphrey Davies, came up with a brilliant equivalent for this one. And you can see it here. Uh, two million people in the square couldn't get him off the chair. But wonderfully, by the time Magdi sent this to us and we got it up on the site, they had. So in many ways, we're very lucky and we really, we consider it, we consider ourselves very responsible and really obligated to be able to communicate from writers all over the world about, about their situations, not only obviously about uprisings and, and things that we might be aware of here internationally, but also simply about 
everyday life. I think um, one thing that we all, uh, that I think we tend to assume is that any kind of publication from these oppressed countries or these countries, um, you know, un under terribly restrictive governments uh, would be, you know, very gloomy, very serious, very harsh, very, very difficult. You know, um, the, you know, the long weeping night of, East Euro of Eastern Europe. And actually, much of what we publish is deeply funny, very funny, very entertaining, and in ways, again, that cross cultures, that transcend what we think of as background and limitations. Um, one of the wonderful things about, there are many wonderful things about being online. Um, one of them, of course, as I mentioned, is that we are free and we are available everywhere in the world that people have computers, which I realize is not everywhere in the world, but still, anyone with a computer uh, can read us. Uh, we do have readers, all, uh, we have readers in um, all six, continent, six continents, we're still trying to get one from Antarctica. Um, we haven't been so good rec with, the recruit, with the recruiting there. Um, but um, we're, read, we're read all over, we've been covered all over the world, and one of the great elements of being online is that everything that we publish is archived and available. So at this point, we have well over, I think we're at 1,100 pieces, probably over that, uh, by writers from, I think we're at 122 countries writing in 87 languages. Obviously, we have a lot of Spanish work on the site because that's um, a language spoken in, I think, probably more countries than any other. As soon as I say that, that's going, I'm going to think of a contradiction. But um, Spanish, of course, being one of the major languages. but. We're also very, very focused on getting, la on getting material from countries and from languages that are seriously underrepresented, not only in, not only in English, but also in what we think, in also um, in our sense of what, what world culture is. So for example, um, we had a Maltese feature earlier this year. Um, again, as I mentioned, every month we have a theme but then we also have a feature um, which collects, say, two to three, sometimes four pieces on another topic um, where we don't want to devote an entire issue to, but we want to present work that, that coheres and that comes together. Um, when we first started, we were doing probably averaging around seven pieces, seven to ten pieces an issue. Uh, now we're up to 15. And again, all of these pieces, with a very few exceptions, are archived. So you can see that if you go to our current issue, and up here is the search function, if you go to find and search, and you can search by, you can search by genre, you can search by authors by country, um, you can search by languages, countries, Keywords, although our tagging is, it, it seems that every time you master a tagging protocol, something else is established. So there is that problem. Um, and you can also search by month and year. And you can, uh, you can limit your search by genre as well. Um, again, we also have a section called Dispatches. That's our blog. And we used Dispatches quite a bit last year in particular. Um, as the uprisings were, were occurring, we had various people all over, um, in, on the ground, again, as I mentioned, such as Magdi, but also um, people in Tunisia, um, one woman in Paris who was monitoring the protests there. And we did have people all over writing for us, reporting on what was going on, and also people in exile and immigrant communities to talk about their perspectives of what was going on. Um, and again, Many of our writers are living safely in exile, but also have to curb some of their activities because their families are still home. Uh, when we published the Axis of Evil anthology, for example, um, we had a group of Syrian writers who we wanted to include who, A, would not agree to be in a volume called Axis of Evil, and B, had so many arguments between themselves that, that they did not want and did not feel they could be published alongside some of these other writers. So again, when we think of 
and, and they weren't just the usual, you know, snippy or you know, random jealousy that occurs within fields. All writers hate each other, just, just the way it is. But, um, but, but again, to, to get a sense of the, you know, the freedoms that we take for granted and the fact that the freedoms that we have not to do things are so much greater than what other people have. Um, one of our Libyan poets, in fact, in, uh, in, in the Arab Spring issues was seriously considering publishing under a pseudonym because she did not want to endanger her family. And her poetry was, it was, a, it was poetry of loss and yearning for Libya, but it was in no way overtly political or criticizing the government, but the, simply the fact that she no longer lived in Libya and was sad about it, she felt could possibly endanger her family there, which is, again, a, a, a horrible example of that. Um, you know, we, we, we depend so much on our networks, and I think that it's something people always want to know when, when you publish an anthology or when you have a publication that draws on work from the entire world. Um, obviously, we don't have that, we don't have that uh, array of languages on staff, and we are, in fact, very tiny. Um, but what we do have is an extensive network of academics, of translators, of people in government roles, quasi-government roles, uh, people who have traveled, multilingual people, and we are in touch with them at all times. Um, asking them to keep us abreast of what is going on in their countries. Not only, I keep saying politically, not only politically, governmentally, but also socially, um, to find out what, you know, who the hottest new writer in Athens is at this point, for example. Um, to know what's being done in Argentina. You know, to have a sense of what people are writing about in China um, when there seems to be a renewed crackdown on the writer's rights. And in fact, our November issue will feature writing about banned and oppressed Chinese writers. And unfortunately, there are many, many candidates. We will no doubt have more material than, than we will need. Um, so maybe we'll do a double issue. But, um, but again, I think we also have another responsibility and it's something that is so obvious that I think it's easy to take for granted. We know that everything we read, every single thing we read, is mediated. We don't necessarily think about that. But everything we read is the result of someone choosing to make something available. Obviously, if you're talking about the power of language, that is only intensified by the power given to present something in translation that would otherwise not be available to people who, to monolinguals or to people who do not read the, the source language. And we always think of ourselves and think of our role in what we select to publish and how we select to publish. Um, again, we are not a political magazine. We are not a political organization, um, unless one, one can say that um, wanting, to, wanting to increase and circulate and promote international literature is itself political. But we want to be sure that we are not representing one viewpoint at the expense of another. Um, and again, we also do not want to be seen as naive. You know, we are not going to say, you know, oh, these, you know, these lovely Iraqis, you know, th you know they're all such, such sweet people. You, you know, that is, not, that is not our point. But we want to show the variation and the nuances of these cultures. And again, the best way to do that is to invite a variety of voices and a variety of points of view. Um, we are, of course, indebted to our translators. Um, if any of you are considering going into translation, I can only encourage you. Um, you, will, you will need to have a day job. I, I will mention that. Um, translation, unfortunately, is, is a, um, a not nearly so, uh, not compensated in nearly the, um, nearly the importance that it serves. But again, the fact of having access to different cultures and 
to being able, again, to see those different cultures and to understand them, I think, is, I think, invaluable, particularly when we can make it available, since we are free, in the educational context, and also that we can make available work that is not in, print, is not in hard copy, that is not available in English. Um, one thing that one, one of our policies is that we do not publish anything that has already appeared in English translation. Our mission is to find and introduce new writing, exciting writing, and there is no point, for example, to publishing you know, the fifth translation of, of Rilke. There is plenty of Rilke available. That's not our mission. Our mission is to find the European and the African and the Asian writers who have not been exposed and have simply not been read or taken out of their native countries, particularly those in the minor languages. Um, much of what we do is intended magic. Um, much, much of what we do is also intended to bring our writers to a broader readership. Um, we have been very, very happy in that we've been able to secure book, assist in securing book contracts for a number of our writers, um, most recently Magdi, as I mentioned. But also, we tend to think of, again, because we, we are so Amer um, Anglo-centric, we tend to think of translating literature into English as making it accessible to the English language publish, uh, public. But by rendering it in English, we are also making it available to publishers all over the world who speak, most foreign publishers, most foreign editors read at least one, one language in addition to their own. Um, and many editors read in English. And thanks to our publication, um, one of our Arabic authors sold rights for his novel to a German publisher, and one of our Romanian authors uh, sold rights to a Spanish publisher. Um, and again, Romanian being a language that has very little, um, very little exposure outside of Romania itself, outside of Eastern Europe. Um, but that gives you an idea, again, of the power of making literature available in English. Um, we are, of course, um, I'm sure I need not say this, we are, of course, a nonprofit organization. Um, we are entirely supported by grants. We have NEA money. We also have funding from uh, many individual donors. Uh, we also have a very generous grant from Amazon. And many people feel that um, that means we're in league with the devil. And uh, Amazon has done horrible things what, what we have to admit, Amazon has done horrible things to uh, the book selling profession and to publish, publishing in general, but um, I have very flexible ethics when it comes to uh, paying authors and translators, so um, we're willing to, uh, there, but there are, there are a couple of people in the field who will not talk to us as a result, um, which is unfortunate. But, but again, um, part of what we are doing now, as I mentioned earlier, is is our education initiative. Uh, and we are working with educators at both the high school and college levels to help, to help make our work accessible, to find out what kind of material they are looking for, what they might need, what kind of supplementary material they would find useful, what they would find helpful in both contextualizing and understanding international writing and presenting it and framing it for their students. So I'm particularly happy to be here today to speak with all of you and to find out how you've been using the anthology and other, liter other international literature in translation. Um, very much hearing uh, what you think about that. Um, before you leave, uh, we'd like to open up the discussion for question and answer. So hopefully quite a few of you who've read the works um, have things that you want to share or ask or even comment upon. So please let, um, let us open it up. Um, 
Um, when you were talking about the Egyptian writer with the graphic novel who was imprisoned and they wanted to eliminate every aspect of the book, well, where were his manuscripts then? How was he able to get a publishing contract? Was it because you had already published his works and you had archives? They took the books, they took the files at the publisher, they didn't take his computer. Oh, and I would have thought they, the computer would have been the first thing to go. Wouldn't you think? But again, they were, they were focused, that's an excellent question, they were focused on the publisher and not on the author. And of course, I also had a complete file of the, of, I had a complete file of the Arabic original. The translator had a complete file. Oh, good. Everybody, you know, there were, and you know, this is why we have flash drives. <laughs> yes. Um, but but that it's an excellent question. They got the publisher's files, but they didn't get Magdi's. You spoke about the, uh, sorry about that. You spoke about the writer that you were able to connect with who wrote the, or Magdi. Yes. He wrote the Metro. What about Syria? Have you been able to obtain any literature from Syria? We had a Syrian issue in, I think, the first couple of years. I want to say it might have been 2005. Um, it was very difficult. Again, as I mentioned, the Syrian writers are particularly um, politi politicized personally, and um, they're, they're very factionalized. I think that would be a better word. I have been very frustrated with the recent events because I do not have anyone in Damascus now. And it is not a place where we used to have a number of um, American translators who would go to Damascus and it's just not very safe for them anymore. And that's been very frustrating. I'm working on uh, getting some, Brit some British people I know who can travel there safely to report from Syria, but it, it, is, it is a frustration. It, we, we have gaps um, in, a lot, in our coverage and you know, as soon as we cover, it's like the Hydra, you cover one and two sprout in its place, but we d I definitely would like to correct that about Syria. Well, I want to thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it was uh, um, wonderful to see all of the, the scope of the magazine as well as the anthologies. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the sort of the process of translation, of how you, um, you know, of who does the translating and what language, you know, how, how, what, how much uh, facility they have to have in each language and so forth. Excellent question. Um, one of the problems that uh, one of the problems that the translation field has is that people will assume that anyone with any knowledge of a language can translate. And translators are writers. They're not transcriptionists. And to do a good translator is a good writer in her native language first. Um, obviously, the more fluent, the better. Um, our translators who have been, we have a number of translators who were essentially bilingual from birth. That's a real gift. Um, as a rule, translators who have been able to immerse themselves in the culture of their chosen country um, can be more effective. Most of the, most of the translators that we work with uh, make a point of traveling to their source countries, of constantly reading, of constantly staying in touch, and really being up to date with what is going on. Um, Obviously, lots and lots of language study, but also lots and lots of English literature study. And just to understand how literature and how writing, how poetry and fiction and prose work. You know, it's, that's an excellent question. I was telling Nina and Bob earlier that I spoke at another college, which will remain unnamed, um, about, the, about the anthology, and a student put her hand up and said, you know, I just don't feel the axis of evil is funny. And you know, I said, well, we certainly don't either. But I think, you know, the, the, titling is such an art, and it's all with the publishers, and it has so much to do with marketing, and what would be, you know, what would capture the interest, what what helps a book stand out. Um, certainly with The Axis of Evil, 
uh, there, uh, when the book was first being pitched, there was a fear that by the time it was published that the term would be out of date. And unfortunately, it is uh, still very much in use today. But yes, of course, titling is always a question. And I think our, um, the Fall of the Wall anthology was probably our least successful in terms of sales. And my feeling is that the market was so glutted then that it was impossible to make a dent. You know, everybody had, uh, had something about, about the wall and about the reunification. You just couldn't make any kind of headway. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, we'll, we're, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary next year, which is quite something for a nonprofit magazine. And I feel that, again, without sounding grandiose, you know, of course we've, of course we've changed the world, but I think that literature and trans, I think work in translation has become more visible, um, unfortunately, as a result of the September 11th events, of the realization, the stark realization that that brought that we are, there are parts of the world that we know not, about which we know nothing that have very firm opinions of us. Um, there are more publishers now focusing on publishing literature and translation. Um, there are also a num there are more graduate programs in translation now. And that's crucial because to train, you know, to train the new generations of translators. Um, it will always be an uphill struggle. Publishing literature in English is challenging. And challenging enough if you're not trying to add the overlay of having the translation. Um, I would like to say that the world, that um, the English language reader is becoming more receptive to foreign work um, and that the audience is increasing. I think that one way to make that happen is to expand, is, is to expand the teaching of world lit in high schools and to capture readers when they're just, really when they're just beginning to develop their sense of what they like and what they want to read and what they want to find out about. Um, yes, I'd like to think we've made a difference. We've certainly helped some, some writers get into English. We've helped some writers do a lot of things. We've, we've, people, a, a lot of other sources in the field come to us for information. Um, a, lot of a lot of writers that we've published um, are now on the, what we think of as the circuit, you know, the festival, the workshop. Um, you know, they're on the list of writers in other languages who travel and who, who appear and make appearances. So I'd like to think we've made a difference. Thank you. Nina. Are you, in, in the introduction to, to the literature from the Axis of Evil, there's a, a section where it says that you had to go through the State Department. Yes. Um, do you have to do that with online? Is there a difference between print and online then that you don't have to do that, or oh, what's going on there? Mercifully, the government, redu um, the government relaxed those rules. Um, very quickly, what happened was that the government instituted a trade ban on any country on any of the enemy nations. You could not do business with an enemy nation. Um, well, that even extended to publishing literature. And it was, so in, it was so extreme that if you published a translation of something, you were allowed to publish it if you did a straight camera-ready copy, but you couldn't edit it because editing meant that you were doing business, meant that you were doing trade. And the, the, what was really fascinating was that the reason that that was put into place, you know, you, it, um, it started with um, Arab, Arabic scientists, and the reason it was put into place, you know, you assume, well, you know, how many can there be? There were over a thousand pieces a year being translated in, for scientific journals. And you have to realize that what that's indicating is a real, again, without getting overly political, you know, there's a real, there's a real desire to squelch and to restrict what is imported. Now, the government did relax those, those rules and we don't have trouble. Um, we still have trouble paying our Cuban authors because they can't take American checks. Um, 
you know, which is really awful, and we end up having to use the, you know, Havana PayPal or whatever, which is you know, not still, I'm not still entirely confident about, but, but yes, there were, there were, and of course, we were also in the position that we thought that was awful, but we're funded by the NEA, so we can't really criticize, we, you know, we have to be careful about how, you know, how, um, you know, outraged we become, or, you know, we have to curb our indignancy. Well, let's give a round of applause to our guest. Thank you.